Hi, I'm Wayne Jones. Welcome to Writing and Editing. This is episode 82, 10 Things That Will Make Your Novel Better. This is not a comprehensive list, of course, but I do believe strongly that if uh, you were to apply all these 10 things to the work you have in progress now, to the novel you have, let's say you're doing revisions, uh, dare I say that I think it would be a better novel, or at least uh, if you pay attention to the the headings here, you know, the, 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 the 10 things themselves, uh, it would put you, I think, in a better mindset to uh, as to things you should be paying attention to. Let's go. Number one, pay attention to the words as much as to the story. Uh, in a certain way, I think this applies mostly to, you know, what you might call contemporary realistic fiction and certainly literary fiction. But it could also apply to some extent, at least, you know, doing, you know to what people call genre fiction, uh, speculative fiction and, and that sort of thing. Um, you know, the, the English language where it's really a blessing that we have, it's rich in words with different meanings and different connotations. And as a writer, you can leverage those as uh, to convey nuances, you know, to to say exactly what you want to say. Uh, you know, there are that's that, that, that's the beauty of it. We have this rich word hoard, as they call it. Uh, and I'm not talking here about using different words for 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 you know the same thing. You know, get a, getting a thesaurus and just changing up the words. That's I definitely, frankly, it's something I'm adamantly opposed to in writing, you know, just for the sake of, oh, well, I've already used word X, so I'm going to use word Y now. It kind of means the same thing. Uh, I, th I think if you have that attitude towards your writing, it's probably not going to be very good writing. Uh, and by the way, in passing, there's probably no word that means in all ways exactly the same as another word. Uh, you know, it may be more or less equivalent, but there's always something that's different if not only the sound, uh, there's a connotation that one has that another one has. So, but the, the, the main message here, pay attention to the words. I think that's, that's a, a very, uh, very important thing. Number two, don't have a message. Uh, I'm talking here about, um, in a in one way you know what some people call didactic fiction where there's a uh, you know the, the purpose of of a novel a novelist taking up and writing the novel is to get a message across uh, get a meaning across because they want to say something about any range of things about something religious or climate change or uh how bullying is a bad thing or whatever it might be you really shouldn't have any messages. If you, if you have messages to convey, you should either use Twitter or if they're longer messages than uh, however many characters you're permitted now there on Twitter, then you should be writing essays and trying to get those published. That's where messages are for in, in nonfiction. Uh, they, they don't belong in fiction. And wh what happens sometimes for the didactic fiction writer is that the message overwhelms the art it smothers any artistic aspect that might have been possible uh because uh you know it's sort of like there there are two things that the writer is pursuing and the message will always predominate the message will always trump the the aesthetics and it could be also that uh you know the the driver the, the driver <laughs> the the writer is so concerned about um getting the message across that they you know that they're not paying attention to the art of the novel to the crafting of the language um and uh, as as the corollary to that is something for those writers who don't write with messages i mean keep in mind you can't assume from what a writer's characters say or do or from the situations that the writer describes that the writer believes in what they what what they're writing about what the writer is writing about it's not like that at all uh just because uh you know i i think people i hope people understand that that you know just because you're writing about horror say or you're writing about 
uh, your father being killed or anything atrocious like like that. Uh, it doesn't mean that you believe that or you, you want that. There's nothing psychologically odd about writing about that in fiction. Uh, those assumptions should not be made. So you should, I suppose it's a two-part thing. You should neither uh, not have a message and also uh, don't assume that there's a message in someone else's non-didactic novel simply because they're writing about uh, a topic that you feel is a little harsh. Number three, don't worry that no readers will quote unquote root for your main character. Uh, the, your focus as a writer really should be as a novelist, a fiction writer should be on making your characters real and believable. Again, in real life, that's where you root for people, where you cheer on your daughter who's running in a race or where you congratulate your uncle on finally quitting smoking. Not in fiction. It's not a it's not a thing. If you have a character in fiction who uh, you know struggles with giving up smoking and finally does, that's it's not really a. At least I never feel those cheering uh, uh, impulses. It's that just I feel like I'm in a different world here. So it's not the case. I would just observe that and you know. Uh, move on kind of thing. It's not about sort of cheering someone on or feeling happy uh, that they've achieved something because, you know, please remember, this is all made up. <laughs> there's no, there's no uncle that's really quit smoking. So uh, it's perfectly possible, on the other hand, and perfectly imaginable and perfectly doable that the best in the sense of the best portrayed person in your novel may be you know either the most evil person in your novel or the biggest asshole in your novel if the if, if you were to meet them in real life uh and the fact the fact that you appreciate the detail and the writing ability that are necessary to portray a bad person uh should make you think you know that you like bad people and therefore that you're a bad person too there's there's absolutely no connection there uh between what a writer writes about and what they really feel in real life or there shouldn't be i suppose is what i'm trying to get at because if there does then the writer is shifting away from writing fiction and they're, they're they've gone into a different mode now they've gone into uh something that's semi nonfiction or something that's a pamphlet of some kind where they're getting a message across or where they're uh, you know portraying an evil that they really personally uh, have a stance against uh, those things should disappear in in your fiction writing uh, they should not be there things are in, things should be in fiction because they fit there uh, not because there's some uh, impulse or compulsion coming from your real life that puts them there. Number four, make the dialogue realistic. Um, you know, uh, one of the things uh, that you that you very very rarely see in fiction is having, and you unfortunately <laughs> get it all the time in real life. You never have characters interrupting each other when they speak. Uh, I won't say never, you sometimes do, uh, or you don't have characters speaking over each other. And of course that happens all the time. Uh, again, unfortunately in real life where people won't uh, let you finish their, your bit before they, uh, say they, their, their bit. Um, you, you see this in film a lot, uh, in bad film anyway. Uh, and it's very rare to see scenes where, People talk over each other. I uh, just happened in the last couple of days to be watching a scene from the really great uh, biopic uh, called Steve Jobs, the one about Steve Jobs played by uh, Michael Fassbender. And there's actually a part there in the scene we were watching where the two characters talk over each other. This is incredible to, I mean, I, I would say you could watch a hundred movies and never see that. The actors basically wait for the other ones to finish their lines. And often you'll see very contrived interruptions where, you know, they know the script 
and therefore they kind of wait it out and it's not done in any kind of realistic way. And then the other thing, like I was saying about actors actually talking over each other, two actors talking at the same time, which is a very real thing in life. And like say in an argument, for example, uh, you just, just think about the arguments you've seen and where people, you know, even though they're, they're ranting against their boyfriend because uh, he's uh, had sex with uh, her best friend, uh, they will very politely let each other speak. I'll speak and then you'll speak. I'll speak and then you speak. That does not happen in real life. I'm in a lot of these, uh, I just want to say in a lot of this, what I have to say here, I'm speaking semi categorically. Uh, you know, when I say never, uh, I sort of don't mean that. <laughs> uh, of course, there are some films and there are some novels in which these things happen. Uh, but, uh, you know, 10%, something like that, it's a rare thing. Number five, describe things like an anthropologist would. Um, this is a more general statement about the liking or not liking your bad and good characters. A writer, a fiction writer, should just present things as they are, depending to some extent on the genre, of course. Uh, presenting a chilling portrait of a serial killer or of a pedophilic priest doesn't mean that you support these types in real life. Uh, it sounds a little parenty to say it, but what you describe well in your novel is not necessarily something that you like or support. Uh, and you should, it's basically, uh, you should be giving free reign to your imagination and what it spills out for you. I'm not saying that you just let it be spilled there and don't, as it were, tidy it up a bit, but uh, it's the imagination you should trust and not uh, be hampering it uh, by what you, oh my God, I'm writing about a serial killer or it's horrific what this priest is doing. I shouldn't be writing about this. Uh, don't worry, it's fiction. You're You're making something up based on things that that happen in real life uh, and this is a, a very common thing just to make a, a kind of a comparison on another art form again uh, you see this a lot in stand-up comedy and audiences of stand-up comedy where audience member make audience members some of them make this mistake when they're watching you know say hardcore politically incorrect unwoke stand-up comedy uh, and they think that that's what the comedian believes. Uh, but the comedian is putting on an act, he, you know, he or she is doing a show. Uh, they're jokes, they're not facts, they're not necessarily what the comic believes. There's no way to tell. So you shouldn't be making judgments about that. You should be uh, making an assessment about whether it's funny or not. And unless, um, oh, I, I guess I have to resort to it, unless you have a very big stick up your ass. If you happen to laugh, that means it's funny and that means it's well done. But it doesn't mean that you support whatever bad thing the comedian uh, uh, has said. It doesn't work that way. These are these are fictional things. These are works of the imagination. Number six, I think, is uh, something that all writers should know and should be doing, all novelists for sure. Leave out anything that's not essential. This, I think, should be a no-brainer. Don't indulge yourself just because you like the thing that you're describing or because especially, you know, you worked hard on a section, say, and you managed to get it written, but on review, you know in your gut that it doesn't fit. It took you five days to write it. Uh, it's uh, 3,000 words delete it you have to delete it you have to get rid of it uh things everything needs to fit and uh there should be nothing in a novel there's no sort of muzak in a novel there's no sort of just waiting for something to happen uh it always should be the things that are there should be essential and should be contributing to the overall plot and structure and character development and all of that there should be nothing that's just sort of there to draw things out there to just wait around and one way to avoid that sort of thing is to rely on the the what i don't know if people use this term anymore uh the telling detail you know this can 
uh, you can use in cases where instead of writing a long passage, you can just pick out one single thing and that can stand for uh, a lot of, uh, you know, the whole thing. I remember this was a long, this was a long time ago. This was in the 1990s. Uh, there's a Canadian short story writer and literary critic and publisher as well named John Metcalf, uh, excellent short story writer. Uh, and he was commenting on a short, on a story by, I think she was fairly new then, although she went on to a very, a fairly successful uh, literary career named Diane Schumperlin. And uh, Metcalf was mentioning about, about a detail that she put in one of her stories. And he, he was just raving about it, how it, you know, it just captured everything. And I, 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 I believe it was, I should have uh, looked up the, the exact details, but it was the, it was the torn and taped up vinyl chairs in a cheap diner. And I can just see that. I think they were orange. I think he was saying they were orange. And, you know, it kind of says it all. You don't need to describe a lot more about that diner. Once you know, you can just, you know, hear that scrunchy sound of the of the vinyl chairs as they sit on them. Uh, you know, generally speaking, in good diners, they're in good repair. And if they're at the state where they don't even replace them, where they just tape them up, uh, that you know that that tells you loads and loads in just a single detail there, and of course that's just one example out of a out of a million that you could choose from uh, from fiction from the from the uh, the total oeuvre of of everyone's fiction. Number eight, don't bring the values of the real world into your fictional world. Think of yourself uh, as an actor playing a role. You know, uh, uh, you, when you sit down uh, at the computer and you're writing a novel, you're a, di a different person then. You know, the, the thing you're writing about is not real life. Uh, you know, just the actor, just think of the actor who's a respectable businessman by day, but he happens on Saturday evening to be in the play Richard III. He's going to have to kill some children you know, which is something he likely hasn't done during his work week. Uh, but, you know, I illustrate that as a kind of an extreme example, just to say that you should bring to uh, fiction what fits for fiction, you know, what anything that fits and not be worried about uh, that these are values that you don't espouse in real life. Uh, you should be, uh, if you're writing about them, you should be giving yourself you're all to them aesthetically and not be worried about, uh, oh, my God, people are going to think uh, there's a scene here where pe where children are killed. Uh, uh, these should not be things that you worry about. Uh, be true to your fiction. This is an exaggeration, and I'll say it straight up to start with. Number nine. Don't feel obliged to tell a story. Uh, and I say this uh, because a lot of the, the language that I hear from writers and from editors and coaches and others who work has to do with storytelling. And uh, I suppose the, the more sensible thing or the more uh, the less categorical thing I would say is that the story is not the only thing. having a story doesn't mean that also that it has to be a sweeping saga that covers three continents and two centuries something domestic something small something focused something intense can have a very very powerful aesthetic effect on readers so um it, it always i always bristle when i hear people over speaking the importance of storytelling yes of course you have to tell a story although there's a lot of experimental fiction and a lot of literary fiction that doesn't tell much of a story uh but the, the point i would make is that there's more to consider just because you've managed you've achieved to tell a story where you know it all the logic fits doesn't mean that you've succeeded necessarily in writing a good novel and number 10 and the final one 
is to remember that it's fiction. Uh, I don't know if you've seen, this was several years ago now, but the, the great stand-up comedian Ricky Gervais was the host of the Golden Globes and uh, did a very... <laughs> Usually the host of these things, you know, there's sort of the elite of Hollywood there. And usually the host treats them kind of nicely. You know, you can't it's sort of like, um, you know, you can't say a swear word in front of the queen or something like that. But uh, Gervais did not do that. <laughs> and the other thing that he said before he got started, he said, and I think this is a literal quote, remember, they're just jokes. We're all going to die soon, and there's no sequel. So I would encourage you to keep that in mind with your fiction. Uh, it's made up. This is essentially the summary of what I have to say, to the permission that I'm urging you to give yourself. Uh, let yourself go. Don't be worried if in real life what you write about would be horrendous or some other bad adjective thing. Just tell people who complain about it that it's all made up. And that's all for this episode. If you want to comment or ask me anything, please go to writingediting.ca and all the info you need is there. Thanks for listening and we'll talk again soon. <laughs>